So today we're in the last week of our dating and marriage series called 808s and Heartbreaks. And one of the questions that I've gotten over the past few weeks is, what are 808s and Heartbreaks? And so if you didn't know this, 808s and Heartbreaks is actually a reference to a Kanye West album that came out in the early 2000s. And he wrote this album in response to some heartbreak that he was experiencing in his own life. And 808s is actually the police code for disturbing the peace. And we thought it would be a good title because here's the truth. If you have unhealthy relationships, you do not have peace and you will have heartbreak. And so our goal with this whole entire series is to help you figure out how you don't have your own 808s and heartbreaks in your own life. And so I've said this from the start, but I just want to say it one more time. It doesn't matter where you are relationally. This series is for you. Uh, Even if you aren't dating or married, the applications we have talked about over the past few weeks and today uh, can help in your friendships as well. But ultimately, no matter where you are relationally, whether you're engaged, dating, married, want to be married one day, or you just have really good friendships, you have to put in the work. And that's what this whole series has been about. And so as we close out this series, we're actually going to be talking about conflict. We're going to be talking about fighting in marriage. Instead of me talking about that solo, you'll notice that there are two chairs up here. Uh, And so my wife is actually going to join us up on stage. And we're going to talk about what conflict in marriage looks like. So welcome to my wife, Ray. (laughs) So ultimately, I, I started writing this series about six months ago. And I was talking to the staff. And they're like, hey, it'd be really cool if Ray was up here. So I was like, hey, Ray, do you want to do this with me? And I said no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, we feel passionate about this, um, specifically because we have conflict in our marriage, and um, we're really good at it. So our hope is to give you guys some tools today that will help in yours. And so Raina got married um, six days after I graduated from college, and we've been married for a little over 12 years. Before that, we dated and were engaged for a combined three years. So we've been a couple for 15 years, and we have had conflict. Uh, in fact, we still have conflict in our marriage. Leading up to this sermon, there was a lot of conflict that we were working through because our marriage isn't perfect, but we've learned over the past 15 years how to have healthy conflict. And while we know there's still so much to learn, we wanna share with you some of the things that we've learned today. And in order to talk about that, we wanna start by talking about how we both experienced conflict growing up because we grew up very differently. Yeah, to say I grew up in a house with conflict would be putting it lightly. Um, I grew up listening and watching my parents have very aggressive fights, like screaming in your face type of fights. Anger and conflict were the norm uh, through most of my childhood, and that bled into my relationship with my siblings. If If we didn't like what the other person said, we fought. If we just were in a bad mood, we fought. Most of the times with our words, but I have an older brother who's actually smaller than me, so he calls me his big little brother. And so a lot of times it wasn't just words, it was with our fists. We would just have knocked down, drag out, just beating each other up in the yard. And so we were not conflict avoidant by any means. So I grew up learning that if you don't like something, you fight about it loudly, right? You yell, you call names, you try to win and you do it as aggressively as possible. And now hearing that some of you are like, oh, he makes so much more sense now. I'm better, okay? (laughs) But for Ray, so that's how I grew up, but for Ray, it was different. I grew up in a house with very little conflict. Um, I'm sure my parents had disagreements, but we never really witnessed them. Um, I actually remember my mom crying if I started to fight with my brother or my sister, and so we would have to go to a separate room and have whisper fights so that she couldn't see us or hear us. (laughs) Sorry, Mom. She's out there right now. (laughs) Um, So... One thing that I really struggled with when we first got married was that understanding that it's normal to have disagreements and to have conflict in any relationship because you're two separate human beings with two separate ideas about pretty much everything, especially when you're as different as we are. Um, But the problem is that I grew up in a very loving home with two parents who loved each other a lot and who loved us a lot. And so in my mind, loving someone meant you never, ever fought with them, which isn't realistic and it's not possible. And so I had to learn how to fight with Michael, but in a productive way, um, a healthy way. So for me especially, I had to learn that conflict was not just going to go away because I avoided it. So Ray grew up in a very non-confrontational home, and I grew up in a very confrontational home, so you can kind of guess the impact of that. 
It was Michael wanting to face every single conflict head on immediately and fight until he won. And he was not nice about it. He was actually really mean about it, um, which you can imagine made non-confrontational me even more non-confrontational. I would get my feelings hurt and I wouldn't know how to tell him that. And so I would just walk away, usually with a slamming door. And we both had to learn how to have healthy conflict despite our very opposite approaches. It felt like an impossible task and we didn't know where to start. But all of our differences came to a head in our first really big fight. Yeah, it was the winter in Cleveland. We had just been married for a few months. And Ray wanted to meet up with some of her friends from work. And she asked me to go with her. And I said yes, but I really, really didn't want to. Uh, I didn't know her friends. And I didn't even know what to expect. So as an introvert, this put me on edge. Uh, we were also running late, which stresses me out. And I'm actually going to share a little bit more about that later. And to make matters worse, it was Cleveland, so it was freaking snowing, right? And Cleveland isn't like Maryland. Maryland gets two inches and like shut it down. Kids don't go to school for a whole week, they're fine. In Cleveland, it's like, oh, eight inches, let's go drinking, right? It's just everything's normal. You, you just do everything like life is the same and there's 12 inches of snow on the ground. Nobody cares. <laughs> and so I asked Ray to drive because I grew up in Northern Virginia, so I legitimately didn't know how to drive in the snow and she grew up in Indiana where we eat snow for breakfast. So I was like, I, I can't do this. You have to do this for me. So she backed out of the driveway and we weren't even a mile from home when we started fighting. We were both clearly frustrated and stressed out and it was all coming out in full force. Our voices getting louder and louder, us getting meaner and meaner. And at one point, Ray looked at me and she goes, well, let's just go home then. And I was more than okay with that because I didn't want to go in the first place. So I told her, turn around in that medical building park a lot and let's go home. And she said, what medical building? And I was like, the one right there. And she's like, I don't see it. And I was like, you don't see the 10-story medical building that says Cleveland Clinic I really on the didn't. side. <laughs> it's massive. But of course, as fights go, and you know this because you've been in fights before, I thought she was intentionally not seeing the building that she drove past every day on her way to work. And Ray thought I was just being mean. And things exploded. Eventually, we made our way back to our house, and every frustration, misunderstanding, and insecurity all came out in a yelling match in our small one-bedroom apartment. We were actually talking about this the other day in preparation for today, and I pointed out that this wasn't our first big fight. This was just the first big fight that we ever had while we were married, um, because we fought a lot while we were dating and engaged, too. And I joked that night when we were talking about it that I wasn't sure why I didn't leave him back then when we were just dating and why I married him. Um, and I can't really answer that now except to say that I loved him a lot, and I saw the potential of what our relationship could be if we could figure out how to have healthy conflict. Um, because conflict can be healthy. So here's the truth. Every healthy relationship has conflict. It just does. But you have to decide if the relationship is worth sticking it out and fighting for. So after yelling at each other for a few hours, we were both sitting in the hallway just completely tapped out, like mentally, emotionally, physically tapped out. And Ray pointed out, hey, something isn't right. And we both knew it, right? Like we both felt deep down inside that something was wrong bigger than not knowing which parking lot to turn around in, but we weren't sure what it was. And so we ended up staying up all night to try to figure out how we got to that point. And while it wasn't the last fight we've ever had, it was the catalyst for us trying to figure out what healthy conflict looks like in our marriage. And so today what we're gonna do is we're gonna share three things that we try to focus on when we're fighting. And these aren't the only things you should do. These are just these things that work for us. And hopefully they can help your current marriage or your future marriage or even some of your friendships. So here's the first thing. And if you're writing things down or taking pictures, this is the one that you want to focus on right now. So here's the first thing that you have to do. You have to focus on the fight in front of you. Right? You have to focus on the fight in front of you. And some of you already know that you struggle with this, right? Um, and this means a few things. The first is that you should not ignore conflict in your marriage or relationships. Instead, you have to face them head on. Right? For Ray and I, like, this happened by accident. Once we got done yelling at each other, I said everything I wanted to say. So I was like, all right, well, good night. <laughs> uh, because for me, fighting wasn't ever about resolution. Right? It was never about resolution. It was always about winning. It was always about being the loudest. It was always about being the toughest. But Ray made me stay up and talk about it and talk about what was going on deep down inside of our souls. 
And I know that confrontation makes a lot of you feel uncomfortable because you'd rather not have relationships than deal with conflict, right? Like if you're conflict avoidant, you're like, nah, I'm just gonna stay at home. I don't need a husband. I don't need a wife. I don't need any of those things. Some of you would rather have endless Maryland summers where it's 100 degrees outside and 100% humidity and you sweat on your way to your car than have conflict, right? Some of you would rather root for the Cowboys than have conflict, right? <laughs> Go Washington football team. Go Pack. Tension in our marriage. <laughs> but you have to focus on the fight that's right in front of you. Paul writes this in Ephesians. He says, and don't, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. In this section where Paul is talking, he's actually talking about unity. He's talking about unity in the church. He's talking about unity in relationships. And it's a section right before he talks about what a healthy marriage looks like. And Paul says, you cannot in ignore the conflict as if nothing happened, right? You can't go to bed full of emotions expecting to sleep the problem away. If there is tension in your relationship that needs to be dealt with, if there is anger in your heart that needs to be dealt with, if there is sorrow in your soul that needs to be dealt with, deal with it. Don't ignore it. Because Paul understands that if we don't face this head on, it will lead to future problems. And just like so many other things that we've talked about in this series, science actually backs this up. An article in Psychology Today came out about a week ago um, that said conflict avoidance actually creates much larger conflicts. When you hold in how you feel when there's conflict, instead of it grow going away, it grows and grows bigger and bigger until it eventually explodes. A small conflict pushed aside can become so large that it feels unresolvable. And so instead of telling your spouse what's bothering you, you allow resentment to build up. You start to create this negative narrative about your partner, making it almost impossible to have any positive interactions with them. So you start to feel disconnected, partially because you're not opening up and sharing with your spouse, but also because because that resentment and negative narrative creates this distance between you. So you have to be honest with them, even when it's hard, and you have to have the fight. So here's the second thing about focusing on the fight in front of you. The fight you are having is the fight you are having, right? It's not the fight that you should have had last week, and it's not the future fight that you think you are going to have once there's resolution in this one. And this is something that I struggle with majorly. When Ray and I have conflict, I have a tendency to bring in past pain past frustration, past tension. But we talked about this in week one of the series. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians. He says, love keeps no record of being wronged. And when Paul wrote this, he's talking about love, but I legitimately think he's thinking about fights because we all know that there is not a better place to bring up wrongs than in that scenario, right? Every fight you are ever in, you're starting to think of what did they do a year ago, six months ago, you know, before we even started dating that I can bring up right now so I can win this thing. But you have to honor the fight in front of you. You have to focus on the fight in front of you. And if there are issues that you need to talk about in your relationships that are unresolved, that's a separate conversation. In fact, when Ray and I are fighting and I try to bring in other things, oftentimes she has to pause me and tell me, hey, that's off limits. Like that is not what we're talking about today. You have that pain that you feel right now that you didn't bring up a few days ago. We have to wait and have a conversation later. And she'll tell me, like, we have to table that. And what that means is that we have to have our first conversation and then have another one right after that, which can be intimidating if you're conflict avoidant. If you thrive on conflict, you're like, yes, schedule it. Let's do this thing. <laughs> and to be honest, if you are in a relationship right now where you feel like there are years of wrongs that you're holding on to, you might need some help working through all of that. And that's okay. And what we would do is we would actually encourage you to seek out marital counseling because one of the best and safest ways to work through past pain without causing current wounds is to have somebody else who helps you with that, right? We are not equipped as people to be our own spouse and psychologist. And so if we have years of problems, we probably don't need to try to figure out ourselves. We probably need somebody to help us with that. And if you are in that place where you realize like that is what fights look like in your marriage, open up your digital connection card and write counseling in the prayer request spot, and we will send you some resources so you can work through that so you don't create current wounds based on past wounds as well. So as someone who is more conflict avoidant, it's really hard for me to not let the sun go down on my anger. I kind of hope that if I sleep on it, the conflict will just go away when I wake up. Um, but the problem is that I might be able to ignore it right now, but in my head I'm doing what 1 Corinthians says not to do. I'm keeping a record of wrongs. So I ignore it in the present, and we might move on and pretend like everything's okay, and we'll eventually go back to our normal life and start interacting like we're not still mad about the thing that we never actually talked about, 
but you better believe that it's going to come up in our next argument, and it's going to be way worse because it's been festering in my heart for the last few days or weeks or even years. And so the thing that I've had to remind myself of is that having a healthy relationship with Michael is worth those uncomfortable, sometimes even hurt-filled conversations. So if I love him, I will figure out how to work through our conflict because he's more important than my comfort. And I know that this is hard. I do. Some of you have become more conflict avoidant like I did for a really long time because you're afraid of the other person's response. Maybe they get mean like Michael used to. And trust me, I know how hard it is to bring up conflict when your spouse's response is unhealthy. You see their anger and you instantly feel unloved. And so maybe this is a conversation you should both be having with a counselor, like Michael said, but in order to do that, you can't ignore the conflict. It might be easier to walk away right now, but is it better? Will it make your marriage stronger in the long term, or is it just easier in the short term? It might be hard now, but it will be worth it. Your spouse is worth fighting for. Yeah, and I've had to learn, even though I'm ready to have conflict right now, like in any scenario, at any moment, if you want to have conflict about anything, like I will have it. I know in my marriage, I need to give Ray some space until she's ready to talk about things. And what that means is usually we've got to get through dinner and putting the kids to bed and finishing up our life before we have the conversation that night before we go to bed. Because if we push it off, it's not going to happen in the next few days and eventually it will become an explosion. Right. So I've had to learn to force myself up or force myself to open up and to be honest and to actually have the fights with Michael. Um, but Michael has had to learn that that's difficult for me. And so sometimes I need space to process before I'm ready to talk. So we meet in the middle. So here's the second thing that we've learned that um, we know will help you guys. Uh, the second thing is this. You have to figure out your feelings. Right, figure out your feelings. And I know like some guys like, ugh, feelings. Like, I don't have feelings. You do, okay? Let's be honest. And part of the reason you have conflict in your relationships that doesn't have resolution is because you don't know why you feel the way that you feel, right? And so for me, uh, like that's something that I've had to work through for 15 years. Right, so we spent a lot of time fighting in the beginning of our marriage because Michael was always angry. <laughs> still a little angry, just not as angry. <laughs> but seriously, every time he would feel hurt, he would get angry. Or if he felt sad, he would get angry. Or if he felt happy, he would get angry. Um, but seriously, if he felt anything, he would just express it as anger. And it took a lot of conversation and work to figure out that he was feeling more than just anger. And some of that conversation was with me, and some of it, a lot of it, was with his counselor. But for us to figure out our feelings, it meant that we had to get to the root of the conflict and ask each other those kinds of questions. So it meant that we both had to decide that it wasn't about being right or wrong or winning the fight. It was about recognizing that our reactions were stemming from something much deeper. I said earlier that I hate being late. And my reaction to that used to be very, very unhealthy. Like, I would just blow up at Ray if she was late meeting me somewhere or when Ray made me late. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I still hate being late, but I have kids now, and so I have no choice but to be late everywhere I go. Um, <laughs> but I've recognized that my reaction to that used to be just incredibly toxic. A few years ago, I was actually talking to my counselor about it because I realized that something bigger was going on. Something was bigger than what my reaction was showing. And I learned that the reason why I responded in such a nasty way to lateness was because of my childhood. Um, in most scenarios, my dad was not an on-time person. And I have very vivid memories of waiting for my dad to pick me up from like my high school small group and me waiting outside for what felt like hours because he was late. Or my dad telling me, hey, we got to get ready for work and we're leaving at this time and him not being anywhere close to being ready. Or my parents telling me to be in the car at a specific time and then sitting in the car waiting so that we could leave. And I remember in those moments feeling like as a kid, like I didn't matter or that the things that mattered to me didn't matter. But when I was a kid, I would just eat it, right? That's what we do. We cope uh, like a lot of you did or you know, even are currently doing. But as an adult, that came out in full force. So I felt sad, like I wasn't valuable, and that came out as anger. And once I figured that out about myself, I knew that I needed to share that with my wife. Did I want to share with my wife that when she is late, it makes me feel unloved? No, because I don't want to be vulnerable because I'm a big, strong man. I have tattoos, okay? But, <laughs> but I had to figure out my feelings, and so do you. Right? So you have to ask yourself in that moment when you feel that way, why do I feel this way right now? 
right? What is making me feel this way? How can I communicate to this to my spouse in a way that is healthy? Biblically speaking, I'm actually just talking about being honest. Seriously, it is all about being honest with your feelings with your spouse. Proverbs 12 says, truthful words stand the test of time, but lies soon expire, right? And we know that in our fights, when we don't tell the truth about how we feel, eventually that always catches up to us, right? You can't lie your way out of your feelings. Proverbs 24 says, an honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. And think about that for a second. A kiss is meant to be vulnerable while you know you are safe. And in biblical culture, it was a sign of trust and peace and humility and even forgiveness. Like that's what honesty is like in your marriage. It's all of those things. So you have to find your feelings and you have to honestly talk about them. Most of the fights you are having are in reaction to deep-rooted pain and feelings of hurt. So you have to dig and dig deep. You have to be real, you have to be vulnerable, you have to be honest. And here's the third thing uh, that we want you to take note of. You need to honor your marriage. So what you need to do is you need to treat your marriage as uncommon, right? Romans 12, 10 says, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. And one of the best ways that you honor your marriage is by actually making it a priority, right? And think about this. What gets your time is your priority. So do you spend more time on work than you do your marriage, right? And obviously you work 40 hours or 20, whatever it may be. But I'm saying outside of work, do you think and spend more time on work than you do your own marriage? Do you spend more of your free time socializing? Do you spend more of your free time with your kids? Do you spend more of your free time with a hobby, playing video games, doing something that isn't your marriage? Or do you spend more of that time on your marriage? Do you go on regular date nights? Do you spend intentional time together at night? Do you know your spouse's love language so you know how they feel loved and appreciated? Because this isn't just about how to win a fight or how to have a good fight in marriage. It's how you show honor so that there are less fights, less misunderstandings, less offenses, less space for bad things to happen. For me, this is really important because when all of our free time is spent doing other things, we don't have enough of those positive moments together. And it can start to feel like all we ever do is fight because the only time we spend dedicated to each other is in conflict resolution. Even if that's done in a healthy way, our relationship can start to feel like work and that can be exhausting. So don't get me wrong, like Michael said in week one of the series, marriage takes work, but it shouldn't be all work. So we have to plan fun, positive, easy time together. Dates, conversations, turning off the TV, putting down our phones, getting a babysitter, so that those difficult conversations don't start to outweigh the fun I know we can have when we're just spending time together. But we have to also make room for those moments by laying the groundwork and working through our conflicts first. Otherwise, our date nights turn into conflict resolution nights, or we start to avoid them because we can't even imagine having positive moments together or having fun. So have the fight, but then go on a date. Yeah, we, we believe our marriage matters more than our careers. Um, the truth is it matters more than this church. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, it does. Our marriage matters more than our kids, plus we know that a healthy marriage will lead to healthier kids. Our marriage matters more than our friendships. And the truth is the same should be true for your marriage or your future marriage. And so if that is true, you need to make your marriage a priority. Set a monthly date night. Set a night of the week where you sit down and have uninterrupted conversations about how the week went and set expectations for the week to come. You need to go on vacation without your kids. Turn off Netflix and go to bed early. Have sex, right? Like we talked about this two weeks ago. Listen to that if you didn't hear it. Make your marriage a priority. Do not give it the scraps of your time and energy. Treat it as uncommon. And this goes both ways. So obviously we'd like our men to take us out, but... Yeah, you should step up, by the way, but... <laughs> but ladies, you don't have to wait around for him to ask you. So plan a date and ask him out. Show him that you love him and value him. The only person that you have control over is yourself. So if you want to make your marriage a priority, then do it. And if you have kids, don't let them be an excuse. I think as moms, and for me especially as a working mom, I often feel like every spare minute I have should be dedicated to my kids, but I have to recognize that a healthy marriage spills over into healthy parenting. Your kids can actually feel the tension between you and your spouse, and you parent better when you're a team and not on opposing sides. So go on a date, find a babysitter, 
Do a date night swap with your friends. You watch their kids one weekend, and then they watch your kids the next weekend. Um, ask a collective kids volunteer. They obviously love your kids. Do whatever you need to do to stop making excuses and make your marriage a priority. So you need to focus on the fight that's in front of you. You need to find your feelings, and you need to honor your marriage. And while that won't solve all of your problems in your marriage, it will help. Uh, and specifically, if you aren't married yet, if you start building these into your dating relationship now, you will see the dividends in the future, right? And even in your relationships, if you put these into play, you will see the fruit from it. You know, in the Bible, there is verse after verse about loving people, right? It says to sacrifice yourself for others. It says to treat others the way you want to be treated, to love other people unconditionally, to put others before yourself. And while we like to connect that to our friends and neighbors, which we should, it starts in our relationships, right? It starts with our spouses. And so the truth is we have work to do, and we have to make our marriage matter, and we have to learn how to love our spouse in the way that Jesus loved us, sacrificially, graciously, and unconditionally. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for... Um, the way that you love us, uh, God, ultimately the way that you sacrifice for us, the way that you um, extend grace to us, the, the way that you don't keep a record of wrongs for us. Um, and God, while we love that in our own life, and, and honestly, God, I think that we love to extend that to other people, uh, other friends, other neighbors, and our coworkers, God, sometimes we struggle to, to bring that into our marriage. And so God, I just pray um, that we do a better job of focusing on our marriage and um, God, not avoiding the conflict, because we know conflict is a part of life, having the conversations we need to have, um, but in a way that leads to growth, and a way that leads to intimacy, in a way that leads um, to a closeness that really, God, honestly moves us closer to you. Um, God, thank you that we get to have these conversations. Thank you that we have the Bible that teaches us um, what healthy marriage looks like and healthy conflict looks like. Um, God, I pray that we can be a church that, that really fights for this and really focuses on this um, and can be something that we grow at. Um, and God, ultimately, that we can show your love to our spouse and our future spouse and our friends. God, we love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.